mock draft season. I've got uh, the first one out that I had to do. Bucky's uh, just came out as well, so be on the lookout for that. You can find both those on NFL.com. Buck, we're going to jump into yours tomorrow. Uh, today, we're going to take a quick peek here at the first uh, shot I took at this thing, which was, by the way, universally praised and well-received on social media. Not an ounce of criticism. Everybody was super excited uh, with how yeah. it went. Uh I'm assuming that. I don't check my mentions, but I assume it was all positive. Uh, let's jump in here and see where we had this thing going. No trades for me in the first one, so let's just line up and pick them. Chicago Bears, I'm sure they would love to get out, but if they're picking right there, I had them taking Jalen Carter from Georgia, Bryce Young, the quarterback from Alabama. He goes to the Houston Texans. Uh, Will Anderson, edge rusher from Alabama. Alabama goes back-to-back. He's the third pick to the Cardinals. Will Levis, uh, who seems to be the lightning rod in this draft class, quarterback out of Kentucky to the Colts. Tyree Wilson, edge rusher to the Seahawks. Uh, Devon Witherspoon, uh, my top corner, he goes to the Lions at six, seven. Uh, Peter Skaronski, offensive lineman out of Northwestern, can play guard or tackle for the Raiders. Uh, at eight, the Falcons going Lucas Van Ness, kind of a kind of a high riser through this past season out of Iowa. C.J. Stroud, uh, he goes to the Panthers at nine. They get their quarterback, and the Eagles, as they always do, go to the line of scrimmage and get Miles Murphy from Clemson. So there's the top 10 buck. A uh, big takeaway from you would be what? Jalen Carter at number one over Will Anderson. Uh, I just want to know why the inside rush as opposed to the outside rusher for the Chicago Bears. When you think about Matt Eberflus and what this team wants to do in terms of playing their style or their version of Tampa 2, uh, it requires pass rushers. And so I just wonder, Will Anderson is a more accomplished pass rusher. Why him over Jalen Carter at the top of the board? Yeah, I had Jalen Carter because I think it's harder to find that guy. And if you use the phrase Tampa 2, was it harder to find Warren Sapp or was it harder to find Simeon Rice? Now, they're both unbelievable players. Uh, but to me, it's, it's just more difficult to find interior disruptors, interior pass rushers. You can't account for them. We've seen it, obviously, in recent history uh, with Aaron Donald, the way he's been able to take over football games. I just think there's positional value-wise – I might place more of it for a player like Jalen Carter, who I think is just harder to find. Uh, even though Will Anderson I love as a phenomenal player, uh, that's why I had that uh, going the way it was there. Rhett, your, uh, your takeaways? Yeah, and I guess I'll just uh, follow up that real quick because you think about the move that the Colts made when Eberflus was there as the D.C. to go get DeForest Buckner as an interior player and, and, and maybe give some credence to that thought of Jalen Carter over Will Anderson there in the interior for the Bears uh, as well. I think the quarterback part, not necessarily the Bryce Young thing. I don't think anybody would be shocked if the Texans go quarterback, and I don't, certainly don't think anybody would be shocked if Bryce Young is the first guy off the board, um, although you could probably have that debate, and we will for the next three months for sure. But I was kind of curious as to why you ended up going Will <laughs> Levis over C.J. Stroud there. And, uh, look, I know I, I feel like at this point I like C.J. Stroud a little bit better. Um, you know, I think the last piece of tape that we saw from him might have been his very best, and that was that game against Georgia. Ultimately a loss, but played very well against that good defense. I feel like that's, that would be a home run there for the Colts, although I still like Levis. I think I would have gone with C.J. Stroud if I was Chris Ballard there at four. Why did you ultimately make that that choice, Deej? Yeah, no, again, this is not going to be how I have him. As you guys both know, it's going to be what I think would happen. And I just think Chris Ballard uh, is somebody that's always been trade obsessed. He's always wanted guys that offered some unique ability. Now, if you just want to watch them and watch their cut-ups, you're going to come away saying C.J. Stroud, he's more consistent, he's more accurate. I would say this, I don't know that one player on Kentucky's offense would start for Ohio State, uh, and yeah. Levis is playing in a, against tougher competition on a consistent basis. So uh, there are high highs for him and some low lows. Uh, his worst tape is going to be much worse than what you see from C.J. Stroud. But I think with his athleticism and what he can do movement-wise, I love what Stroud did in that last game, but you have a lot more uh, canvas to go off of in terms of Levis's athleticism and his ability to extend, create plays, make things happen on a pretty inferior team there uh, in the SEC right. at Kentucky. So, again, not that I would take him over Stroud uh, at this early point in the process. Uh, right now I have Stroud over him. But if you're thinking of Chris Ballard, Buck, um, you know, a guy that, that you can monitor and track his track record thus far, he likes the guys that are, you know, traitsy, and that is definitely Will Levis. 
Yeah, that definitely is Will Levis. It's, it's interesting. That's going to be the fascinating discussion. And I already know because uh, we're going to get hit up about it. Everyone is going to attempt to make the comparison between Will Levis and Josh Allen. I think it's a little different, but we'll see. That will be the debate that we will have on the podcast, on Path to the Draft, on every other show that we have on the network. Will Levis is going to be squarely in the crosshairs because I think he's going to be one of the more polarizing prospects in this draft class. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, all right, let's get through the rest of it here. Let's go 11 through 20 and see if anything jumps out to you guys. At 11, we've got the Tennessee Titans uh, going Paris Johnson out of Ohio State. I won't rip through each and every one of these picks, but a couple interesting ones. You've got Brian Branch is a uh, – thank you, you're welcome. Uh, Brian Branch could play some, some nickel, could play some safety. At, I'm not so sure he could play outside a little bit uh, going to the Patriots at 14. That Alabama, uh, Bill Belichick, Nick Saban connection, not a surprise there. I've got Trenton Simpson, a linebacker, going 18 to the Lions as they try and remake their front seven. And I've got another edge rusher going to Seattle at 20. So I have them going with two edge rushers, try and juice up their pass rush a little bit. I know that's something that uh, Pete Carroll – uh, wanted to focus on. Rhett, I'll go to you first on this one. 11 through 20, names, uh, positions, yeah. teams. What jumps out at you? Yeah, yeah. I, I think Joey Porter at 12 to the Houston Texans. You know, after they get their quarterback, you know, and then you're talking about another marquee position in today's league, right? You talk about shutdown corners. Got one last year all the way up at the top at number three with Derek Stingley. Uh, was off to a really nice rookie campaign. Got banged up towards the end of the season. Didn't see him a ton in the second half. And now you pair him up with Joey Porter Jr. I mean, you want to talk about long levers and athletic traits and a guy that was the best in the business, um, or at least uh, right up there during the entirety of his Big Ten career in terms of corners in that conference um, and facing pretty dang good receivers too. Um, and obviously the name should sound familiar. Uh, it will be and it, you know, a real, real fierce competitor type of guy. I, just, I like Joey Porter. I think that's a real interesting way to go at it with the Houston Texans, you know, to find a pair, you know, of shutdown type corners in Stingley and now in Joey Porter, if that's how that ends up falling. I think that's real intriguing there in the AFC South. Let me, let me tee up on this, Buck, real quick. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. But your Jags, mm -hmm. this is a division in the AFC South that yeah. if you're going to build your team to win in the division, you had your sights set on the Tennessee Titans and the Indianapolis Colts, two rock 'em, sock 'em, physical line of scrimmage teams. Think about the big time backs, Jonathan Taylor and Derrick Henry. I feel like now when you see the trajectory the Jags are on with Trevor yeah. Lawrence, I feel like if you're building your team to win that division, as Houston is going to attempt to do, I think the Jags and what they can do throwing the football is going to be more in your sight line than maybe the physicality of the Titans and the Colts previously. I think that's the way you have to build your team in this division right now with, with your Jaguars in mind. You know, now it's funny because we're in there speaking the same language because I was going to talk to you about the depth of the cornerback class. Like looking at four guys in that last little 10 section block, it, it speaks to what teams are going for. Uh, it is funny because the league has shifted. We have seen more two deep safeties, more umbrella coverages where they are taking away the deep ball and they're still trying to tighten up the coverage underneath. Some of that is with two man. Some of that is with some of the quarter stuff where guys are staying on top of really squeezing. And so when I look at the guys that you have listed, uh, Christian Gonzalez, uh, the versatile player in Branch, and then you talked about Joey Porter Jr., long guys, athletic guys who have what I would say very deep toolboxes that enable them to do a few different things. It's going to be interesting to look at this class. I'm really excited to study them because it appears to be some ballers and playmakers in this group. Yeah, I've got 10 or 11 corners looking at my list that I think are, you know, potential first round guys that are going to be in the mix. I think you're going oh. to see you're going to see at least 10 corners go in the top 50 picks. You might end up seeing 13 corners go in the top 50 picks. Kind of what we've had with receivers in years past. I think it's going to be corners this year. Uh, it's a good group, it's a good deep group. Um, let's get to the uh, let's get to the finale here. Let's go 21 through 32 and see if we don't have any other questions here. 21 was a fun one for me. Dalton Kincaid, who I love at tight end, uh, coming out of Utah, he goes to the Chargers to give Justin Herbert a big time weapon. We've got Bijan Robinson. Don't know where to put him, where to place him. Uh, he's a top 10 player in this draft. I have him going to the Buffalo Bills, uh, all the way down there at 27. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't shock me if, if somebody took him much, much higher than that. It's, t it's tricky trying to figure out uh, the running back position there. And then you've got the last one, 
uh, there at the bottom, 31, Jackson Smith and Jigba, wide receiver out of Ohio State, who would be a perfect slot for the Philadelphia Eagles. You have Devontae Smith on one side, you've got A.J. Brown on the other, you throw him in a slot, and good luck uh, trying to stop those guys. So, Buck, your takeaway here, 21 through 30. Actually, I should say 31. I've got to get used to that. Only 31 first-round picks this year. The Miami Dolphins uh, had theirs taken away. So go ahead, Buck. Well, I know there's some people in the Charm City that are really looking at that Anthony Richardson pick to the Baltimore Ravens, trying to figure out what does that mean for the Ravens (laughs) and what the Ravens are going to do going forward with Lamar Jackson. Uh, Considering that Greg Roman is no longer the offensive coordinator, what does that mean? Is Richardson there to maybe play a backup role uh, for Lamar Jackson while Lamar Jackson plays on the franchise tag and then he graduates and Anthony Richardson takes over? Or is this a situation where we believe Anthony Richardson, who has tremendous tools and traits, is he going to be a guy that can play in any offense? To me, I think that's the fascinating discussion after those last handful of picks. All right. I right, want to get to your point on that one here, Rhett, and I'm going to ask you to answer this yeah. as well. We all have kids. So let me just I'm going to I'm going to give you this is from the Ravens press comments that I listened to the other day uh, with John Harbaugh and Eric DaCosta. The question was, will Lamar Jackson be your starting quarterback week one next season? And the answer was not yes from Eric DaCosta. It was I don't see why he wouldn't be. So let me let me just let me just let me just change the scenario here. Okay, Rhett, you have as your kids get older, the boys get older, and Buck, you've already been through this. Um, hey, will you be home at 11 p.m. tonight, son? I don't see why I wouldn't be. Uh, that's not the answer that I'm looking for. Yeah. A simple yeah. yes, yes, I will be. That's it. It's just a Can little I- semantics there that I was like, you know what? This thing, the contract's not done. So we can all say, John Harbaugh, 200%, he's going to be here. Well, there's no contract. So at this point in time, I don't think we can take that as gospel. That, that's just my take. Can I, can I offer an alternative John Harbaugh answer um, to that same question? And, and I, think, I think it might fit the, the family mold a little bit. While nobody knows what the future holds, I expect to be enthusiastically coaching Lamar Jackson in the season opener for the Baltimore Ravens <laughs> next year. Is that, would that have been, would that have, would that have sufficed? Yeah. Would that have satisfied Mixing you? your Harbaugh's? Mixing okay. your Harbaugh's right. together? Got nice. Yeah. Nicely yeah. done. Uh, all right. Hey, let me, let me jump in with, uh, uh, with what you, I saw Rhett? here from 21 to 31. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of talked about it a little bit when I was talking about Daniel Jones and supporting him when we were talking about that Giants-Eagles game. I think that's a real nice spot for the Giants to be in in terms of wide receiver class this year. And and I'm glad you mocked Jordan Addison there to them. They just they need more dynamic playmakers, you know, and uh, after, you know, wasting a first round pick on Kadarius Tony and, and by say, you know, wasting it because he's no longer there anymore and has made some plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, not saying he's a bad player, just saying it didn't work out for them there. So it feels like a waste. Um got to go get a guy to support Daniel Jones. You just, you got to continue to do that. And I, I, DJ, does it feel like that's kind of the sweet spot for wide receivers? I mean, that's your first one off the board right there. And, you know, you only get two in totality in the first round. <coughs> yeah, no, I, I'm curious to see where these guys go. And I know I've, I've gotten questions. Why is this guy not in there? Why is that guy not in there? I think the, uh, the teams and that I've talked to and just doing my own evaluation not high on this receiver class so they're willing to wait push these guys down a little mm-hmm. bit i don't think we see a ton of these guys go early um i will say this uh it's kind of an interesting spot 17 the pittsburgh steelers i know uh they have pieces uh, i you obviously love what they got from george pickens but man you've got a quarterback and kenny pickett who made some sweet sweet music with jordan addison at pitt uh that would be tempting Ooh. even though they have offensive line that needs to be addressed uh, I'm sure corners is big on their priority list, but that would be a that'd be a fun one to see those guys get back together where they played college ball together. Go ahead, Brett. Hey, by the way, by the way, um, is this the third year in a row, the fourth year in a row that we've mocked a first round running back to the Buffalo Bills? Like, I feel like it was Najee Harris two yeah, years ago, it was Brees yeah. Hall last year, Bijan Robinson this year. Maybe, maybe we they get should it. have. Third time's a charm. Maybe they yeah. should have. Yeah, maybe they yep. should have watching them play against Cincinnati. Uh, Buck, uh, running backs, Bijan Robinson. Again, I, are you in the same boat as me in that love the player? I just, I'm, I just don't know where he's going to go, and it could be way high up there. It could be down here in the range where we have him in this one. 
It's funny because you have him going to the Buffalo Bills, and I think that would be a great spot for him. But how about the pick that's right before them, the Dallas Cowboys? We have seen uh, what the Dallas Cowboys potentially would need uh, with Ezekiel Elliott being on his last leg, Tony Pollard suffering an injury, and that offense needing some juice. I think somewhere in that range, B. John Robinson should go because there's no denying the talent. The guy is an unbelievable playmaker with the ball in his hands. He can run it physically between the tackles. He can catch the ball out the backfield. This is a, uh, I mean, a premier running back. It's just that the position has been devalued so much that you just don't know where to peg him because you just don't know how league executives are going to view taking a running back in the first round. Yeah, no, it's going to be interesting to see uh, where he ends up going. But, man, he is a phenomenal football player. Uh, so we'll see. Again, Bucky's uh, mock draft is out as well. We're going to jump into that one tomorrow. We'll get a chance to break that one down. This was a, a fun one today, breaking down these games. We'll get into Bucky's mock draft on the next episode. We'll have a chance uh, later on in the week to preview the conference championship games, which should be a lot of fun. So appreciate you guys hanging with us here. Uh, we'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks. <laughs>